All right, kiddos, you are dismissed. Uh, Jason, you good? Hey, you're, you're taking care of your own baby. This is a big one. <laughs> uh, so today, we're going to be asking the question, what if other religions are right? What if other religions are right about Jesus in particular? Uh, there's a whole bunch of little analogies online. I just like this particular one. Uh, and it, it basically, a whole bunch, but it, it goes essentially like this. Uh, that there were these um, cotton farmers, and they were uh, having a conversation, and they were arguing with each other, and they were arguing over religion. You know? And then this one believes this, and this one believes that, and they're arguing. And then there's the, the, the old grizzled guy. I pictured him, you know, you know, cast as Sam Elliott. You know, he's got a hat on. He's scruffy. He's probably smoking a cigar. And they're like, hey, Jim, Jim, what, what do you think about all this? And he says, well, you know how we got to get to the cop gym. And some of you go up and over the hill. And it's the shortest distance, but it's a hard climb. And some of you go to the east side of the hill. Uh, but there's all those you know, sharp rocks along that side. Uh, your feet are always sore at the end of it. But then there's others that go around the west side of the hill. It's a long walk, but it's the easiest. And he says, but at the end of the day, when you get to the cotton gin, the gin man, he just says, how good you cotton. And he says, that's how I feel. You know, and so when we think about religion, this is how we think about it. This is putting it in the more... Uh, succinct way, people believe that religions are superficially different, but fundamentally the same. What people think is, is that religions are fundamentally, are superficially different, like, yeah, they have a little different, a little different paintings out there, superficially different, but fundamentally the same. But the truth is, religions are superficially similar and fundamentally different. Fundamentally Different. And so, really, what we're going to do today, because I didn't want to turn this into a 14 week series, I'm looking to end it on Easter, uh, when we talk about what if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Uh, what I want to talk about here uh, for a minute are three just different world religions. And I try to grab very different kinds of world religions so that we can probably bring application to multiple different sets. So, really, it's kind of like three mini sermons, and then we'll bring application to all three at the end. So the first we're going to look at is Jesus in Islam. Again, we're asking ourselves, what if these religions are right about how they view Jesus? And so the way that Islam views Jesus, there might be a couple things that surprise you. Um, first of all, uh, first of all, they believe Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is in the Quran. Uh, very similar to the way that Judaism would view Jesus, that he's a prophet of God. We're going to talk about that more next week as we talk about the uh, triumphal entry. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, Jesus as the prophet. Are the Jewish people right when it came to that, yes, Jesus, you know, what was Jesus? And there was a lot of confusion what they believed, but... Uh, we're going to look at that more next week, but Islam believes he's a prophet. Islam believes that Jesus was born of a virgin. All right, it says that in the Quran. All right, that he performed miracles. All right, that's you know this is unique and weird. Like Jesus does things that even their prophet Muhammad doesn't claim to do. They believe that Jesus is coming back. All right, they believe that Jesus is coming back. Now you can do a deep dive if you want to, and there really is a lot of little interesting uh, articles and YouTube videos and things like that. The way that uh, the way that Islam describes the end times is actually really similar to the way uh, the Scripture, the Bible, describes the end times, except totally opposite. In that, uh, when I say it's similar, it's that if you take the perspective, if you take the perspective of the Antichrist. That is actually the way that the Quran writes the end times. So I think if I had to guess, and I don't like talking about guessing at the end times, because it's all guessing. There's so much guessing. 
One of my guesses is that both Christians and Muslims are going to think that their scriptures are correct when it comes to the end times. And it's because the Muslims are looking at the Antichrist and saying they're right. And we're looking at the Antichrist and saying we're right, but we're calling him the Antichrist and they're calling him the Messiah. Uh, and so it is really interesting if you just switch the perspectives. It's, it's really... It's really simple. Uh, here's a really interesting one, is that the Muslims are really strong on that Jesus was crucified on a spike. And it's not only the Muslims that believe this. Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that Jesus didn't die on a cross, but died on a spike. Okay, And this comes from the, the uh, word for cross in both Aramaic, Arabic, and Greek could mean, no doubt, could mean spike. It can mean cross, it can mean spike. So we know historically that the Romans used three different things as a torture device. Number one was what we would think of, I, I call it the capital T. It really wasn't a lowercase t cross, like what you're wearing around your neck now. Uh, they would use like an uppercase t cross. Uh, and, and, but that is what they would use to crucify like this. There was the X-shaped cross, if you Grew up in Catholic, you can call that St. Andrew's cross. All right, the X-shaped cross, they would tie you up like this, arms and legs spread. Uh, and then the third way they would crucify people, I'm going to wear a long shirt today, uh, is uh, they would crucify you like that. Uh, and they would, uh, and so it really is just where your hand position and leg position. Uh, and they would crucify you like that. They would use the term crucify on, on a spike. So that is absolutely, historically speaking, hypothetically possible. If, if you want me to like give you like that's a really big deal to you how we prove that he was actually, he actually died on a cross and not a spike, my best argument would be when Jesus is talking to uh, when Jesus is talking to uh, Thomas and he says, "Look at my hands, the nails that pierced them." He specifically uses a plural word for nails. If he was crucified like this, he would use one nail to crucify his hands, and he said nails. And you're like, that's the best argument you got? I'm like, yeah, everywhere else it just says cross. And so if the word cross can beat spike, how do you argue against it? Uh, the easiest thing is, it doesn't really matter. All right? If Jesus died on a spike for the sins of the world and raised again three days later, it would work. All right? <laughs> it's not like, oh no, this messes up everything. Right. <laughs> Salvation would still work, uh, and we would be, you know, wearing uppercase eyes around our neck instead of lowercase T's. Um, and so, like, would that be that different? No. But there's a reason why Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses both hold so tightly to this, because they also can't prove that it wasn't a cross. They're just saying this word is the word we use for spike. That is true, it's just also the word we would use for cross. Um, and so, uh, like, it, it literally just means, tor it literally means torture device. Uh, but this, the reason why they're so strong on it is because they're, but they're saying that you Christians have been lied to for centuries. It's meant to sow doubt in what you believe. Like, hey, you've been taught your whole life it's uh, a little lowercase t, right? You know what? I'm going to show you right here. Let's open up Aramaic Bibles, and I can prove to you it says spike. All right? And you're like, what have I been lying to? If you've been lied to about what he's been crucified on, how much else have you been lied about? All right? And both Islam in the 600s and Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1800s, hundreds of years after this occurred, do not have better archaeological evidence than we have. All right? They have the same archaeological evidence that we have. They're just trying to show, sow a seed of doubt to get you to say, maybe I've been lying about more things. All right? Listen, you do a deep dive on that and see if you come up with any like really great pieces of evidence. Uh, really isn't. There's little things here and there like, oh, maybe there's a spike. And they're like, ah, eh, no, probably not. Um, but it is meant to just say, I think you've been reading this book wrong, and you've been lied, and these translations have been deceiving you. It's something really common that you hear from Jehovah's Witnesses. Your translations have been deceiving you. Our translation won't deceive you. Okay. Uh, our one translation that 
we don't even know who actually runs the Watchtower anymore, but that one's not going to deceive you. But you are being deceived. So both Islam and those witnesses, both are really strong about this. Uh, and then in Islam in particular, Islam doesn't believe that Jesus actually died on the cross. They believe that Jesus was rescued from the cross before dying. That yes, he was dying on the spike. He was dying, but God rescued him because that's what God does to his prophets. This is what God does. He rescues. And so God rescued his prophet Jesus, and that is how he is able to come back. So they do not believe that Jesus died. All right? And the whole idea behind Jesus as a prophet, and it's the same concept that we see in other religions as well, is that Jesus came to show us the way. Did you hear that? That Jesus came to show us the way. That he didn't come to be the way. He came to show us the way. That he came to show us what love looks like. He came to show us what love of God looks like. What Show us what humility looks like. To show us what compassion looks like. To show us what... It's just to show us something. Our end of the cross was meant to show us that, you know, what Jesus is willing to do for us in the same way we should be willing to die for God, all right, and his will. And so he's just showing the way, all right, and it ignores what we would call the substitutionary atonement, which is what Christianity is all about, that we couldn't earn salvation on ourselves. I've talked about this before in Islam. There's an expression, if you ask someone who's a Muslim, like, are you going to go to heaven one day? Their, their answer is going to be, Lord willing. Lord willing. And that is, it might sound normal to us, like we might say something like that. We might say, yeah, yeah, Lord willing. But I don't think we should. And it, we certainly don't mean the same thing. They're saying Lord willing because they know they have to have followed these five pillars of Islam. That they've got to pray so many times a day and make sure they don't eat during certain times of the year, make sure they've given a certain amount to charity, uh, make sure they've attested to God who God is and who the prophet is, uh, make sure they've gone back to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. So each of those things are, you can only say, I hope I have done well enough. I hope, because there isn't a standard of, this is what good enough looks like, because good enough is perfection. And they know we're not that, so they have to just say, yeah, I hope my prayers were heard and that God shows mercy to me. That, and so, Lord willing, I hope. Our answer is that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That Jesus took the penalty that I deserve to pay. That any grace and mercy I am shown is because of what Jesus earned on the cross through his death. He took on our death and our punishment in our place. Uh, I, there's going to be three different passages I have you turn to. It is in the app if you are like, I can't be turned to three different passages. <laughs> all right? It's all in one spot on the app. It was just too long to write up here. Uh, and I'm going to read it. We're going to break this passage down more on Easter Sunday. All right? and, but I didn't want to ignore it. Now. It's almost like I get to introduce this passage to you now. And then in two weeks from now, we'll break it down a little bit more. But I want to introduce it to you today. So I'm going to read it weird, like a letter, like a story that Paul was writing. All right? So I'm just going to kind of read it straight through here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Brother? That's always not good. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preach to you. You, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and the Twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive when I'm writing this in about 60 days a week, 30 years ago, uh, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to one untimely born. He also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now if Christ as raised from the dead, now if Christ is proclaimed as rise from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If it is true, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so he is saying, like, this is not a secondary issue, this is the primary issue. The primary issue is that Jesus died and then rose again. If he didn't die, he can't raise. And if he didn't raise, you are still in your sins. You are still in your sins. Nothing happened. If Jesus was on the cross and was beaten and was tortured and was dying, and Jesus rescued him before he could actually die, you are still in trouble. You now have a great little example <laughs> you have a great little example of what sacrificing yourself for others might look like. And that great little example will do nothing for you. <laughs> that great little that great little story uh, is worthless if Jesus doesn't actually die and literally raise from the dead. All right? And so this is when it comes to Islam. Of all the good things that some Muslims do, and they're Muslims are just like Christians. There's ones that are just Muslim and there are there are many or millions that are really devoted. Pray a ton, pray a ton. All right, they do all kinds of like nice things, a good thing. None of that does anything. None of that works if Jesus, if they're not putting their faith and trust in Jesus, which is fundamentally not a part of Islam. Uh, but they have a total misunderstanding of Jesus, where they are saying that, oh, the you know, Christians of all the apostles and all the pastors have been lying to Christians for all these years. Oh, no, 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 it is they that are lying about Jesus. It is they that are misrepresenting who Christ is and are presenting a Christ that isn't interesting enough to follow. They're presenting a Christ that isn't unique enough to believe in, that he is just a prophet like so many other prophets before him. But in fact, he is something totally, totally different. To take another look, and again, we're going to bring application of all these three at the end, I want to take a moment and look at Jesus in Hinduism and Buddhism. I put Hinduism and Buddhism together, not because there's not differences between the religion, but the way they view Jesus is about the same. The way they view Christ is very, very similar. And the way we would describe this is, uh, uh, oh no, what happened? My PowerPoint did not save. Um, it's in the, uh, it is in the app. Um, I mean, I can actually get my, my computer is in the kids' room, and I bet you if I just hit refresh, it'll do it. So Jesus in Hinduism um, is the idea of him being a guru. All right, Jesus is a guru. All right, and we are like, what is a guru? All right, so a guru is someone that is better connected to the spiritual world. All right, so all of us are living here in this physical world. We're very distracted. We're, we're like little barracuda. We're distracted by every little shiny thing. All right, so this world constantly distracts us. Okay, and in this distraction, all right, we can get too focused on the physical realm. Well, now, in Hinduism and Buddhism, gurus come along, all right? And they help you see the spiritual world for what it actually is. They help you see the spiritual world for uh, the complexity 
than it really, really is. I'm going to try to hit refresh on this because I do have a little video I want to show here in a minute. Um, we'll see if it obeys. Can you just go uh, back check and see if I close out and go back in and see if it um, saves? Try to see if it goes in the connects. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Look, technology not totally bad. <coughs> All right. And so a, this guru, a guru would come along and be like, I'm going to show you, like, this world, is it really real? And they're going to kind of, like, peel back the world and show you the spiritual world. And so Hindus and Buddhists have no problem when they read Jesus, so they'll read the same Bible that we read and be like, oh, he's a guru. He is pointing out the spiritual, uh, he is pointing out the spiritualness of the world, even though people only tend to see the physical qualities of the world. This is the challenge in that part of the world when you get to Eastern pantheistic uh, worldview, uh, people with an uh, Eastern pantheistic worldview, is very quick to accept Jesus. You share the gospel with a Hindu, they're going to add him right in. Okay, where do I put this little cross? I'm going to hang him, you know, right next to my little Vishnu, right next to my little Shiva. Let me just add him right in. All right, I got a million gods. One million and one didn't hurt nothing. All right? And so this is the mindset of every path leads to God. There's a very uh, famous uh, expression of a, an Indian guru, and he took he was teaching his little disciples, and he had these five blind people come up, and he tell he says, "I want you to come up, and I want you to tell me what it is that's in front of you." And the first uh, the first man, blind man, goes and he feels around. He's like, "Oh, it's a tree. I'm feeling a tree here." And the second blind man comes up, and it's like, "This is." This is a wall. This is a wall. The third one comes up, and, he, and he's like, "This is a uh, this is a rope. It's a rope of some sort." Uh, another one comes up, and he's like, "Oh, it's a it's a snake. It's a snake." Well, now, what everybody could see is that these blind men were all touching an elephant. All right, one was grabbing the leg. There's a way that everyone's kind of right. All right, and we love this kind of idea that I don't have to disagree with everybody about everything. All right, but the answer is that is incorrect. They, the answer is they were all wrong. That's <laughs> really what the answer is. No, it was an elephant, you blind idiots. All right, like that's the the truth in that people might see everything, but when you actually can see, you see what it really is, and it's an elephant. And there are people that are blind and seeing little aspects, and there is no doubt there are little superficial things. People, religions around the world have picked up on these fundamental ideas of there is something greater than us. There does have to be a creator. You shouldn't murder people. All right, these are things that we've like, huh, we've kind of reasoned from the evidence. All right, but it's not, it's saying that we basically superficially grabbed some truth, but we have missed the fundamental truth of what it is. Uh, it's also really interesting when the way that Hindu or Buddhist would look at Jesus as a guru, is they would believe Jesus when he would say, I and the Father are one. They would believe Jesus when he says that because they do understand this idea of everything being connected. The idea of Jesus is God is true to them because God is everything. All right, That's what pantheism is. Pantheism is that God is in everything. All right, And so they are looking at Jesus. And Jesus saying he's God is like, good, finally someone just saying it. You're God. I'm God. Everybody's God. All right, uh, and they believe when Jesus died, he merged with the God. He merged with God. Uh, and this is when you hear somebody say namaste. What namaste means is the God in me recognizes the God in you. That's when they say namaste. The God in me recognizes the God in you. And so we as Christians might hear that and be like, oh, yeah, yeah like, so like the Holy Spirit's in you, the Holy Spirit's in me. I said, no, it means something so different. They're saying that. If God is everything and you are something and therefore you are God, uh, and so they're just saying Jesus, by him calling himself God, him being, you know, all the expressions that he really is God, he's part of the Trinity, all these things are just a way of expressing that he is one with the universe now. So how do we look at the idea of Jesus um, being one with the universe, Jesus is a guru? 
Well, my answer to this is in the movie The Life of Pi. Uh, and if you haven't seen the movie, I love The Life of Pi. I think it is just beautiful in every which sense of the word. And the storyline is this little kid is like grows up in India, and so he starts as a Hindu, and then he converts to Islam, uh, and then he converts to Christianity. And so he is a Hindu Muslim Christian. Uh, and he tries to follow all three. His dad doesn't understand that like, you can't do that. You've got to pick one. Uh, and the whole movie is very postmodern. It's one of the examples I use in my classes is like, this is what postmodernism is, that there are these people that just want to be everything. They, want, like, they don't want to disagree with anybody, so they want to be a Hindu and a Christian and a Muslim. They want to be everything. And it doesn't make any sense. But there's this little scene in the movie where this, this little kid asks the right question, and he gets a terrible answer, and it messes up everything. Here's the question he asks, and here's the terrible answer he gets. As a Catholic priest he's talking to. Why would a God come back? Why would he send his own son to suffer? Why would he send up ordinary people? Because he loves us. God made himself approachable to us, human, so we would understand it. We can't understand God not his perfection, but we can understand God's son and his suffering as we would have wanted. That made no sense. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed, grown up high. So this is what happens when you try to do the I'm, I'm trying, I, he's a good example. He's a good example to us because the, the kid like picks up on it. He's like it's a, good, it's a good example of a father sending his son to suffer? What's the good example in that? Why is that a good example? I don't know, he's showing he loves us. There's got to be better ways to show you love someone. I love you so much. <laughs> Kill myself. I'm like, but that doesn't make any sense. All right, it's, the answer is easy. He, the, God knows everything. He loves his son. Easy. We, we see this play out like in the story of Abraham Isaac. That like, there's clearly, he loves us up. We are celebrating when another sacrifice comes along. All right, and now here comes God's son, whom he loves, whom he cherishes. He's been in eternal fellowship with, and he loves the world. And now there's this, okay, I love the world so much, I am going to send my only begotten son, so that he can die on the cross for the sins of the world, because it's the only way to salvation. It is the only option. If there were other options... Jesus would have taken the first whip from the cat of nine tails and been like, ah, no, there's no shirt. <sighs> okay, follow Muhammad, follow Buddha, it's close enough. <sighs> that hurt. Pretty, pretty close, so just get close. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the rest of the way. <laughs> he goes through it because it's the only way to salvation. He goes through that torment, and the worst torment of all, which we can't really comprehend. We, it needed to be this public so that no one could deny that he actually died and rose from dead. Jesus tries to do this privately. No one would believe that. So he publicly dies. He's executed. Publicly raises from the dead. And in a, it needed to be horrific. Otherwise, we would have missed we would have missed it. If they basically like, okay, we're just going to tie you up. We're going to just tie you up here. Okay, wait, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Emma. Um, it, if it wasn't horrific, we would miss the true horror of what it was in this moment where the father turns his back on the son. You know, where Jesus is crying out, like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, for the first time in eternity, was separated from his heavenly father. For the first time in eternity, he wasn't connected to his heavenly father. This was hell for him. Like, this was horrific. And so as horrible as we could describe the physical torment Jesus went through, it is nothing compared to the spiritual torment he had to go through in order to take on the sins of the world, to become, he who knew no sin became sin. So he becomes sin personified. God pours out his wrath on his one and only son. Dies. Three days later, defeats sins and defeats death by resurrecting from the dead. He asked the right question, and he got the dumb answer. 
The right answer is, it's the proof that this was the only way to salvation. If there was any other, the Father would have taken it. The Son would have taken it. It was the only option. The Son was submissive enough to the Father to say, I am not my will, but yours. I think of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses um, 12 through 20. Once again, I'll break this one down a tiny bit more. Um, but uh, we're going to kind of just read it so that we can kind of bring out the application of the end. In Colossians 1, uh, 12 through 20. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Poetic. Delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here's the big key here, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones and dominions, rulers and authorities, all things created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. From a, a, an Eastern pantheistic or Hindu Buddhist mindset, what I love about this, there, this passage is that it really does... Jesus embodies all the things they think their Hindu trinity, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. All right? Brahma is the creator. All right? Vishnu is the preserver. He basically holds this world together, keeps that's who you would generally pray to if you need something. And Shiva, the destroyer. But Shiva is coming to destroy. This world to them, it's so that it can be remade new into something better. All right, and so they celebrate all three, they pray all three, they eat all three. And here comes Jesus basically saying he is over all these things, that he is greater, he in himself is greater than all these things. All things were created through him and for him. So he is the creator, and he's the Lord and ruler of this world, and he is worthy of all honor and glory and praise because of what he has done. It goes into verse 18 and says, He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. All right, and this is the idea. This is the struggle I told you that, that many people have. They like Jesus in there. They, they want Jesus in the mix. They want Jesus in the pantheon of beliefs. Even in New Age believers, they, they're, they're fine with Jesus as long as they get to be the one to decide what Jesus what they do with Jesus. As long as they are uh, that Jesus is just one of the many. All right? Jesus is fine when he's one of the many. And here it says, no, no, no. All these things have happened. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the ruler of the church. He is the firstborn of everything. He is the ruler. And he must be preeminent. He must be first and foremost. And it doesn't work. Nothing works if he is not first and foremost. You are diminishing him. You are offending him if he is not preeminent in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. What an interesting thing. Peace through the blood. Peace through the blood of the cross. That here's Jesus ruling this world, and it is broken, and it is fallen, and it is sinful. And he himself, the creator himself, goes and dies for his creation in order to redeem it, or save it, or restore it, or bring peace to it. Whatever term you like best. But what a great passage to exemplify that Jesus is not one of many, he is the one of one. That he is not like God, that he is not God-like, he is not revealing God, he's not connected to God, that he is God himself, that all the fullness of God dwells in him. There is nothing about him that is not God. He is God. 
One last thing that will bring application, and I wanted to grab Jesus. Why didn't put the title? Jesus in Mormonism. Jesus in Mormonism. Mormonism in America today is the second largest religion in America. Christian, if you take Christians and Catholics as one thing, so Protestants, Catholics, if we wanted two, then they were maybe number three. So if we take Christian dumb, is that a better word for you? Christian dumb. Um, more, there's more Mormons than there are Muslims in America. There are more Mormons than there are Hindus in America. There are more Mormons than there are any other religious identifier in America today. About two percent of the population. All right, two percent of the population are Mormon. All right, and uh, they all kind of look alike. Um, this is what when it comes to. Mormonism, that Jesus is a God. It would be certainly similar to what we would say with Jehovah's Witnesses as well. Jehovah's Witness like literally changed uh, the translation of Scripture, which is why they say you can't trust your translation, you should trust our translation by these non-Bible scholars that who are writing this at New York and the Washington. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They literally add that little that word A in there, that he's a God. So Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are very similar in that one sense. And I know we tend to group them together because they're both kind of prominent Christian cults in America. Uh, but Mormons are very, very different. And I always try to find a line. Where is the line to be respectful and truthful? I don't think I have any Mormons in here, so I'll just be truthful. Um, where... I, when people ask me, what do I think is the craziest religion in the world, that's easy, Scientology. Um, if you ask me what the second craziest religion in the world, I think about it a minute, but then I say Scientology for number two as well. Um, and then if I have to go top three, I'll go Scientology third. But if I go fourth, Mormonism is fourth. All right? um, Mormonism is is really is the is insane it is the insane rantings of a not sane person uh, i'll just read out through a couple things jesus is the son of god because god slept with mary like sexually speaking just like we would think of as like in greek mythology satan is jesus's brother not because it's just their brother but jesus has a whole bunch of siblings there's a whole bunch of beings in this universe and in others that god has slept with lots of women over the years. And so Satan is one of those, and he was a bad one. Uh, and Jesus is a good one. Jesus is coming to redeem you. He is one of many gods, and it is not wrong to call God an alien. Uh, and when I say that, it's because in Mormon theology, God used to be a being like us in a different universe. He was a being like us. And he connected so, like he was so pure in thought and actions that he had attained a level of God. He became a God because of his obedience to something. I don't know what. But then he created a universe. So the universe, not just saying planet. They used to say planet back in the 1850s. They changed that in the early 1930s or 40s. So no, no, no. He didn't just create our planet. He created the universe. So he created this universe. He is the God of this universe. But he used to be a being like you. And look at what you might be able to become. You might be able to make your own planet or your own universe one day um, a Pokemon or whatever. Well, you can make whatever you want. Um, and so it is not wrong to call God an alien. If he used to be a being like us. He's basically they're just saying that he is a being that's just so far beyond our comprehension. He seems like a deity, but he really is just a, a, an advanced alien. Um, Adam brought mortality, and Jesus brought immortality. And again, that might sound similar, uh, but they actually celebrate Adam. And when we talk about Adam, we talk about Adam as a tragic figure. That what an idiot! <laughs> like, don't disobey God. Why are you doing this? They look at Adam as a good thing. So Adam, we were, he created, God created spiritual beings. But as spiritual beings, that's all we would be able to be. So when God created us, we were just spiritual beings. The journey that we were going to take now for immortality is we first have to become mortal. So Adam made a sacrifice. His sacrifice was bringing death to himself. 
but he brought death knowing that once we create a physical body and then shed it, that spiritual body has the potential to become immortal. And so Adam is celebrated as a prophet as a, he did the sacrifice to become mortal, that Jesus makes the sacrifice to become immortal. This is raving nonsense. And then Jesus uh, saves those who perform good works. So this is my response. Um, why is Joseph Smith a prophet? Why is Joseph Smith a prophet? I don't know. Like, there isn't anything about him. He didn't perform any miracles that proved what he said. He made a whole bunch of historical claims that there were two extra tribes, that there were 14 tribes in Israel, and that two of them came to America after the Exodus and populated the Native American. That that's what Native Americans are, or Jewish people living in America. And that they built cities of gold and preserved the true scriptures of Abraham and whatnot. He, there, there's no evidence of that. They have done genetic check testing in Americans, not Jews. Uh, the, we can prove that genetic. We've not found any of these giant cities of gold that were supposedly under the Salt Lakes. Uh, we didn't find any of those. They were in Missouri, first of all, and then they got kicked out of Missouri. He says, oh, wait, no. You don't. Um, he did this Mormon bought, uh, one of his followers bought a Egyptian papyrus in Egypt. And he then, then Joseph Smith, who was not an Egyptologist, translated it into the book of Abraham, which then is added into the program of Great Price. And it basically tells this whole story of Abraham. Well, they used to show off this papyri to people, and people, uh, Egyptologists were like, that's not what it's saying at all. It's just a, it's just a burial. It's just, a, it's just the record of the burial account of this one random person. It has nothing to do with it. What are you talking about? Like, that's not what this word, like, they can translate it. And so then it mysteriously burned in the Chicago fire uh, in 1904. Uh, and so we can't read that anymore. We can only read the translation. I... It, it is easy to poke fun at it when I'm around people. And I, I, would I be respectful when I was talking more? I would. This is the biggest reason why. The biggest reason I would be respectful is they, they don't know any of this stuff. If when you talk to a Mormon that you meet, they won't know half of what I just said here because they go to church on Sunday and they're taught to love their neighbors. And they're taught to be kind to others, and they're taught to give their church, and they're taught to love their children, and they're, they're taught a lot of good, positive, we would all agree on things. It's not until you move up in different levels, they have different names. You'll introduce themselves, they'll call themselves brother, uh, but that isn't the same way we do. That, that's a level up. That's when you, brotherhood is the first level up, and then you can um, become a deacon, and you can become a priest, and then you can become, you like, you keep leveling up. And as you level up, you learn more of the secrets that ultimately you are hoping to be your own God, your own universe one day. And when the biggest key is you can't add to Scripture. If if you talk to a Mormon and say, let's do this, strip away the Book of Mormon, take away the Book of Mormon, take away the Pearl of Great Price, what does God's Word actually say? And that's what we have to focus on. Uh, in Hebrews um, chapter 1, it tells us that a long, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, last set of prophecy that we're getting, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The, there is no other God but Jesus. He is God. There is no other universe outside of being able to sit at the right hand 
of God, the right hand of the Father. There is no other creator other than Jesus himself. Right? And so to say that Jesus is some lesser being than the creator is ignoring all the different passages of Scripture. Right? And this is, um, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about that Satan in many instances presents himself as an angel of light. I guess maybe our thought is that, okay, when, when Satan tries to deceive people, that he's always going to deceive them in, like, all right, red leather spandex and horns, uh, you know, point of view. No, like, <laughs> he deceives subtly. And so you look at, like, Mormonism, and it's like, wow, they are more conservative than us than in a lot of senses. They dress more conservatively. They are they, they are stricter when it comes to what you can and can't do. No caffeine. All right? That's a sin. Like, Chris, Christians be drinking all kinds of caffeine. caffeine. All right? Not a single one of you doesn't drink caffeine. Uh, like, and that, that's like, they put that up there as like, they're alcohol, caffeine, mushrooms. Um, so like, they, it is, if they want to just put it as like, yeah, don't put it, like, they have all these rules. And so we look at that, and they're like, oh, that's, that's really godly, right? Lots of rules is really godly. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. All right? What godliness looks like is worshiping the creator and the savior of the world. So when we, when we get the big remember, all world religions seem to do the same thing. They take away the full deity of Christ, or in some instances they take away the humanity of Christ, but it's not as common in world religions today. It was actually in the early days of Christianity, they were facing that more often, that people were saying he was God but not human. Now it's much more reversed. They're saying he's human but not God. Uh, and they all make salvation a works-based solution for the afterlife. Every world religion is exactly the same except Christianity. Everyone is saying Jesus isn't God, and everybody is saying you have to work to earn your salvation. And here comes Christianity saying the opposite. We're saying, no, Jesus is God. And we're saying there is no works you can do that can earn your salvation. Nothing. It is by grace through faith alone. <coughs> when we take application there's this personal, and then there's this, there's the personal, and there's the, the um, evangelistic application to it. The personal is this. We have to understand this better. This is all of us. The deity of Christ is really difficult. Like, God is complex. Like, understanding that Jesus is both God and man, that's hard. Like, that is not, our brain immediately starts to, like, like, our eyes start twitching when we start thinking about, like, Jesus being God. How is, how is this conversation of the Father and the Son? Are they the same way? No, but the Son is the Father. And so we have a tendency to just be like, oh, I don't want to think about that stuff. And, and we need to. And, and there's, the reason why we need to is, A, it will always lead to worship of Jesus. It as he, at, as complex as he is, we worship him in that complexity. The last thing we want to do is figure out that, like, wait, Jesus is, like, super simple? Wow, oh, that's dumb. It, there is no, there is no going to be a plot reveal that, like, oh, this is really easy. If Jesus was simple and basically was just like a little two-dimensional cardboard cutout, then we'd be like, why am I worshiping that? We worship him because he is so much more complex than we are. We worship him because he is God. Uh, and he is worthy of all this worship and honor and praise. And it is worthy to do so. We worship as we come to these little understandings, these little breakthroughs where we gain an inch of knowledge. There is this moment of worship, this moment of awe, this moment of mind blown here. And that is good. That is worth it. Right? And then we really reflect on it. We want to make sure we never think about Christianity as just this list of rules and this do's and don'ts. And then I'm a good person if I go to church and read my Bible two or three times a week and you know pray occasionally. Look, no, that's not what makes you good. What makes you good is that God declared you that way. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus and he saves you, him saving you is what makes you good. 
Uh, that is then what we, like, the disciple then starts. Like, okay, I want to honor, obey him, and understand him. And then now we're heading in the right direction. Uh, and so it's worth it. The evangelistic angle of that is, this is what we need to be able to communicate to people. This is clearly the confusion that different religions of the world have about Jesus. And it is worthy having a conversation with them. And, and you can fault me and come up and yell at me afterward, and I, I would not have an answer for you. And they're like, why are you making fun of Mormons' holy underwear that they have to wear? And I'm like, well, I didn't make fun of them yet, but I did right there. Um, but uh, there is value in, in listening and talking to people about what they believe. And this is what I said before. You're not going to actually run into a Muslim that like knows all these things that their their apologetics are teaching, and all these Hindus that know all these things that some Hindus believe. Listening to people on what they believe is valuable, so that you can share with them. Well, where are you getting this information? I'm getting my information from the Bible. So this is what God's Word says, and let's argue it from a "Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God?" standpoint. If you don't, let's deal with that. And then once I can show you, I think this book is unique and special and different and interesting. And I can let me, there's a lot in here about who God is. All right, we can share with them the truth of God's word. And then helping them begin to understand, which is mind blowing, you can't earn salvation. All the things you've been doing to try to become one with the universe or to try to honor Allah uh, or to try to honor this. This being so that you too can become a being like him, you will never become God, guys. Uh, but if, if in their pursuit of being God, like, no, like, this is what the scripture actually have to say. And this becomes this evangelistic. We know what we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to deal with who Jesus is, and we're going to have to deal with that no amount of good works could ever be good enough. And there's rejoicing in that. There's fear when we find out we can't be good enough. And then there's joy when we find out that Jesus loved us enough to make a way, to become the way for us to be saved. Let's pray together. Jesus, I do, uh, I do want the opportunity to share the gospel with someone in my life who might be being deceived by Muslim teachings or Hindu teachings or Mormon teachings. God, I pray that you can open their eyes, show them that your word is something different, something special, is something unique, that when they hear your words and they hear who you are, that they are broken to the core, that they realize in that moment that they have never honored you the way you deserve to be honored. That they have never worshipped you in the way you deserve to be worshipped. That they have never thought of you the way you deserve to be thought about. I pray that in our own lives that we pursue understanding. That we do spend our lives trying to understand your nature better. Your character better. We try to understand your actions better that we understand who you are so that we can worship you better and that we can then communicate that truth to others better. Jesus, we love you and we praise you for your patience with us, uh, your kindness towards us. Uh, Jesus, we do pray that we can be the ambassadors for you uh, that you want us to be. This is not new. This is what your apostles, your followers your, have been dealing with for years. <clears throat> People that have their own beliefs in God and that they're they're believing just what, you know, they're believing something false. You brought, you intersected into this world to bring truth to this world and we are to be those truth uh, bearers. We are to be the, uh, we are to be carrying this banner of truth, this uh, we are to be carrying this torch of truth in every community we live in and work in and shop in and serve in, that we share with the world that you are the light and savior of the world, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.